I'm going to get our panel to tell you about themselves themselves, um, which is great because that's less work for me. Um, but we have on the panel uh, this morning Julia Faiporti, she is Chair of Just Speak. We have Roy Marta Smale, she is Director of Braithwaite and Smale. We have three aspiring MPs uh, in this coming election, Kerry Allen from the Labor Party, for the Labor Party, Chloe Swarbrick for the Green Party, and Nicola Willis for National. Please welcome our panellists. Don't forget that you will have an opportunity to ask questions after they're all going to introduce themselves and um, tell you a bit about their work. Uh, I'll be scribbling furiously at the end there, um, and I'll have some questions, I'm sure. Um, but we really want, once again, to hear from you, um, because it's not about me, it's about you. So uh, have a good think about the questions you might want to ask, and I'll take a show of hands um, once they've all uh, had their little chat, and you'll have an opportunity to ask those questions. Thank you. Ko Ranganui, kei runga, ko Papa tono, ko uh, kei raro, ko nga uh, tangata, kei Wanganui, tihei Modi ora. Enga mana finua o te nei rohi, uh, ko karanga mai, ko fakato mai nei kia tato, uh, nga mahi nui kia koto. Uh, enga fana o New Zealand Drug Foundation, uh, te nā koto kato. Enga uh, mana wanui, a nei a hikurangi mihi atu kia koto. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko wai a hau, ko hikurangi toku maunga, ko waiapu toku awa, ko Ngāti Parau toku iwi, ko Julia Amoa Whaipoti toku ingoa, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora everybody, my name is Julia and I am uh, the chair of our board for Just Speak. We, and we've got some of our whanau over here, we're predominantly a volunteer based rūpū and uh, we our, our aspiration is to empower young people to speak up and speak out for change uh, on the criminal justice system based on evidence and experience. One of the main issues in our criminal justice system, which we cannot separate from the corridor that we are all having here over these past yesterday and today, is the mass imprisonment and mass and targeted criminalisation of Māori uh, in, our, in our justice system and we know things need to change. We need to do things differently to have different results. And we've talked about the statistics about um, how many Māori are in our prisons and filling our beds that cost over $100,000 a year to fill uh, are in there because of minor drug-related offences. Uh, just a little bit about, I suppose why this kaupapa is very real to me and for many people in this room and the communities that we walk in, talk with, or talk about. I usually have a photo of my, of my mate, which my mate called Toko, he turns three in August. He is um, also my, he's very loved, he's very happy, and uh, I like to roll around with him because he makes me cooler. Um, he's also my nephew, and he is also, at a minimum, nine times more likely to end up in prison uh, than than other babies. He hasn't done anything yet. Um, but that's a problem. That's a problem to have this young, this young little boy who is living life as he should and who doesn't know what bias looks like or feels like and doesn't know actually it matters that his, his father, my brother, has been in and out of prison for the last 20 years for a number of different things. The first time he entered was we lived in Australia was um, because he had cannabis. And he's 10 years older than me. He uh, is much darker than me. And I have felt, uh, I have seen and felt how he's treated differently to me when we walk, when we walk in this world. But the impact around him having entered prison, um, at youth prison when he was younger, uh, because he had cannabis on him, and then he's gradually graduated up the poor-hearted chain of offending, um, has 
intergenerational consequences when we look at Tuku and Tuku's brother now, Takaria, that the fact that they haven't done anything but they're, they're nine times more likely to enter prison just because he's been touched by the system. Um, and also the, the discrimination that, that he faces in terms of getting paid mahi, being able to provide opportunities um, to support his whānau. But one of the things quite recently actually that our whānau's wrapped around to support those babies and um, Tōkō will, he doesn't have much choice. He has a few more years to eat Play-Doh and then um, he, we've got work to do and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be walking with him always wherever, he, wherever he, he ends up. But I've prescribed a list of things he's got to do and he can um, do other things. Um, but my brother was born with a, with a munted leg, I don't know how to say that differently. His mum was in a car crash. He has uh, his cartilage and all of that stuff is like gone. His legs. 70 years old, he's, stopped, he's been told, your leg's like your 70. He has said to me he wants to get it cut off because he can't live with that pain. He's an alcoholic and his vices are turning to marijuana and alcohol to relieve that pain. He is on, on pain relief, which I know he's getting addicted to at the moment. And I know that it's, it's hard as Fano to be like, bro, we need you to sort your stuff out but he doesn't have the support within the systems to enable him to just not live in pain and to enable him to stand 40 hours a week at a pie shop so that he can bring an in income for his whānau. Because for his own mana, it's important for him to be the provider. And it's very difficult as his tainer, because I'm 10 years younger than him, to be the one who's like, oh, look at me, I'm a flash Maori standing up here on this, on this stage having this conversation with you. And I can because of the opportunities I've been given in my life that he hasn't. And the impact, intergenerational impact on that, that t statistically Tōkō's not meant to either. I guess the bigger question around that, we've heard our statistics about our mass imprisonment of Māori. We know over half of our prison beds are coloured Māori. We know every single step of the way in our criminal justice system, Māori are going to get worse off outcomes than non-Māori for the same offending. We have a structurally racist system, and that's uncomfortable for people to say. Our police commissioner has come out and said it. We cannot even start to come up with the solutions if we cannot own that that's the problem. Let's not sugarcoat it, that's what it is, so let's do something about it. We're very much committed as a kaupapa to uh, come up with the solutions, um, come up with the solutions, or we walk together because we want things that are different for our next generations. We need to leave the world better than we found it. And when it comes to Māori, New Zealand's are very tolerant, are very tolerant of making sure that we're entrenched in, in those negative statistics. And we have to ask ourselves why that is the case. Hoi and I can talk a lot about this all day or a day, and I'd, my, I'd like to talk myself out of a job. Like, I'd like to walk together, oh, this is for free, by the way, this is my for free job, but, um, <laughs> but I'd like to talk myself out of my for free job. But, um, yeah, there's, a, there's broader conversations we can have. We've got a hui coming up in Aotearoa um, that's targeted as a cup of Māori a hui where we want to bring Māori together because we've all got different ideas about how we can fix the problems. But we have the solutions. Um, we need the opportunity to speak for ourselves as well. Um, and I'm conscious of time here, my quick rant here. Um, but finally, in this room, there's a lot of power here. I feel like we're talking to ourselves. We all kind of agree there needs to be things done differently. There's a lot of expertise here and there's lots of the boring stuff, which is really important, like the reports and the smart people who do the boring things, important boring things. Um, <laughs> but we're in danger of having another ohui no doi. So I just propose that at the end of this, I think that we should have a resolution as a arupu of attendees who have come here to A, um, we saw the political mess that happened in here, except so for our mates who came from the States, I was like, oh, they thought that was really good. And I was like, oh, they got Trump. But, um, <laughs> So relative terms, yes, anything is better. We need to expect more. We are a small population, relatively high resource. Let's do more, New Zealand. Let us in our room use our collective power to, and voice, because there are many people who we are speaking about that aren't in this room, to influence the boring people who are coming here. No, no offense. Um, to do change. So cross-party accord. I want to have those scraps there being like, no, I've got the biggest and this is not the right approach, or there's not enough evidence. I'm like, oh, wank, wank, why are we saying that there's a crisis happening? We are locking up people, we are locking up our children before they've even entered. We are wasting our money. And we are, we are giving up on our children when they, 
when they walk into this world. That's not okay. So I don't care about which gang you're in when you're with National, Labour, Greens, whatever. Work together. Cross-party accord. Second thing is I call for our media as well because the way that we message the stories around Māori, if we look at real numbers, real numbers of just gross numbers um, of our Pākehā children, this is not vulnerable Olympics, but Pākehā children dying at in those real numbers to our Māori children as well, but we hear the negative Māori stories and it's always attached to our culture. We are not inherently criminal people and we need to call on our media to do, do something else about that. And I would, uh, the other joy would be that we collectively, there will be some things we disagree on, but endorse the New Zealand Drug Foundation's um, policy that they launched yesterday because we know that that will lead to statistically better outcomes. Anyway, let's just put that out there. Let's have some joy at the end of this. Noreira tēnā kōta katoa. Just introduce my mate, Roy Matsai. She can introduce herself. Ngā mihi nui ki a kōta katoa. Ko pirongi a te maunga, ko waipā te awa, ko ngāti mani a pōtō te iwi, ko ngāti pēhi te hapu, Ko te korapatu te marae, ko Roy Mata Smail tōku ingoa. My name is Roy Mata Smail. I'd like to thank the New Zealand Drug Foundation for inviting me here, and it's been a wonderful learning experience for the past two days. I'm a lawyer, and in August 2015, my client, Tom Hemopo, who is a retired probation officer, filed a claim in the Waitangi Tribunal against the New Zealand Department of Corrections. For the benefit of our international visitors, uh, the Waitangi Tribunal hears claims of breaches of the promises made in the Treaty of Waitangi, which Kylie talked about this morning. And it's a big job, <laughs> because since the Crown uh, signed the, the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840, the main thing it's really done is breach it. Um, and this <laughs> has created a huge toll on Māori of disadvantage and marginalisation. We've already heard yesterday and again this morning that a Māori person is more likely to be arrested, convicted and imprisoned than a non-Māori person. And of course that's led to the statistics that um, Tracy, uh, Tracy talked about, um, one of the most well-known statistics in New Zealand, that while we have 15% of our population are Māori, half of our prisons are full of, uh, half of the people in our prisons are Māori. But my client Tom's claim was against the Department of Corrections specifically. And so it had to be very focused on people after they're convicted. Our Corrections Act says that part of the purpose of the corrections system is rehabilitation and reintegration. Yet it turns out that the likely outcome of conviction is not rehabilitation, but actually the beginning of a cycle of reconviction and re-imprisonment, which is very hard to break. And for Māori, we heard in the Waitangi Tribunal that this cycle is even more entrenched. And Tracy, again this morning, um, set, out some of, set out that statistic that within five years of a release from prison, 80.9% of Māori released have another conviction, and 547 are actually back in prison. Yet, my client's claim was that the Department of Corrections has no accountability for these disproportionately high reconviction and re-imprisonment rates for Māori. So a year ago this month, uh, the Waitangi Tribunal, just down the road, heard from my client Tom, uh, iwi supporting his claim, and some of the leading experts on corrections and Māori in the corrections system. Just Speak supported the claim and Julia gave evidence as well. The tribunal also heard from senior officials within the Department of Corrections and the wider justice sector. And I'd like to refer to Tracy again um, because I think some of her evidence was particularly relevant to the co-papa of this symposium. In particular, she talked about churn she said that churn describes how the vast majority of people in prison are actually going in and out, in and out, on very short sentences. And we all know from the past two days that the vast majority of those short sentences 
are likely to be for minor drug offences. In turn, the tribunal heard that the vast majority of people caught in that churn are Māori, and specifically, young Māori men. So for Māori, a conviction is likely not just to be a conviction, but actually the beginning of years of cycling through the correction system. And I think that that means that Māori have a lot at stake in terms of our drug laws. The Waitangi Tribunal released its report on the claim in April, just a couple of months ago. And the New Zealand Drug Foundation supported the claim and there's actually a one-page summary of the report in the inside back cover of the latest matters of substance. The Waitangi Tribunal found that Māori reconviction and re-imprisonment rates prejudicially affect Fano, Hapu and Iwi and the ability of Māori communities to sustain their well-being, their culture and their mana. It also found that there is a grave risk that the impacts will reverberate through generations. And as Tracy already mentioned, the tribunal estimated that there may be 10,000 Māori children with a parent in prison. The tribunal found that the Department of Corrections was not doing enough, and it made a number of recommendations. One of them was that the department should commit to a Māori-specific target to hold itself accountable for Māori reconviction and re-imprisonment rates and to report publicly on how it was going in meeting that target. So the department has set a target to reduce Māori reoffending by 25% by 2025. And of course I hope that there'll be scrutiny of what the department does in the coming months and years to try and meet that target. But actually I'm more interested in the accountability that I hope that such a target finally brings. Now that the department has committed publicly to a target, if the rates don't come down, the Crown can no longer avoid the question of whether the Department of Corrections is actually capable of bringing down Māori reconviction and re-imprisonment rates. And that in turn leads to other questions like, if our corrections system doesn't help Māori, if it doesn't work for Māori, do we need to be looking at our laws, including our drug laws, and at who we are sending into the system in the first place? Which, of course, is the question that we've been debating for the past two days. The New Zealand Drug Foundation is one of the organisations that has supported my client Tom's claim, and that has been amazing. Um, I think that the Tribunal's report on his claim supports the exploration of our drug laws that you are all undertaking here, particularly in terms of Māori. And I hope that it is a tool for you and for Māori in continuing that important exploration. Kia ora. Kia ora everybody, I'm Nicola Willis, I'm Nationals candidate in Wellington Central, so this year I'm running for Parliament uh, for the very first time. So I stand here um, looking at an audience full of experts um, and, having spoke, and having listened to two women who are clearly um, making a huge difference in their work and are absolute uh, experts in that work. So can I acknowledge you, Julia and Roy Mata, for the words that you've spoken. I think the contribution that I uh, can make to this conversation today is a personal one from the heart, um, because acknowledging all of the mahi in this room and all of the expertise, um, I want to share with you my perspective as a mother. I am a mother of four children. Uh, my son James is seven, my daughter Harriet is five, um, my son Reuben is four, and little Gloria is almost two. So when I think about these issues, when I think about the issues of drug reform, when I think about justice issues, uh, when I think about the overrepresentation of Māori in our criminal justice system, what I think about is how can we make sure that we reduce the harm that is occurring for so many people in New Zealand who are using drugs? How can we reduce that harm? How can we ensure fewer of our young people use drugs? And how can we ensure 
that the terrible situation of Māori overrepresentation in our justice system uh, is, is overturned. So I actually think that's pretty non-controversial. <laughs> I think in this room today, we, we share those objectives. Um, and I, I heard about the political panel yesterday and, and, the, and the fireworks. Um, and so my, my plea today is to say, well, can we focus on these shared objectives and talk about the how and the, and the how we're going to get there? So there's just, there's just three things that I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly, uh, acknowledging the expertise of those before me. The first is, when it comes to minimising harm in, in terms of drug use, I think really what we need to do there is we need to make sure that the penalty regime and the offence regime isn't creating more harm, but at the same time, we need to keep to this idea that we need evidence that any changes we make aren't going to encourage or facilitate more people uh, to use drugs in New Zealand. Um, and I say that from a personal perspective, because right now the conversation with my kids isn't happening, but in a, in a few years it's going to be happening, in five or six years. And when they talk to me about drugs, right now that conversation's easy. I just say, you know what, they're illegal, and actually they're really, really bad for you. And in particular, when it comes to marijuana, I'll be honest with them and I'll say, look, when you're older, lots of people try it, it's not the end of the world, but actually as a teenager, there is medical study after medical study that says that stuff can stop your brain growing properly and it can destroy your beautiful potential. So please don't go there. And by the way, it's illegal. Now I accept the evidence and the research in this room which says actually it, it's more than just saying it's illegal. That's not how we keep kids off drugs. I accept that there's more that we have to do. But what I will want to do at every step in this conversation is test. Is this going to make it more or less likely that our tamariki are going to try drugs and are going to become involved in the harm of drugs? So that's, that's my personal um, plea today. Uh, the, the second thing that I, I want to say is that I think this point that we've made and the wonderful work um, that Roy Mata has done in terms of the Waitangi Tribunal uh, needs to be acknowledged. And we need to acknowledge that as a country we need to work very hard on reducing overrepresentation of Māori in our criminal justice system. But we should also acknowledge that there, has been, there is some progress being made. There has been a decrease in Māori youth offending, there has been a decrease in Māori adult offending, and we are seeing that there are innovative approaches that are having some impact. Just as the drug and alcohol treatment courts are having some impact, we're also seeing that the Rangatahi courts have had some good progress in reducing reoffending by Māori. We've also seen that we've got um, progress happening in terms of drug and addiction support, with the numbers there increasing dramatically in terms of the people who are getting support in those areas. So I want to acknowledge that progress um, and stand with you in saying that we need to make pro more progress and we can make more progress. So uh, Kerry and Chloe will speak now, but to come back to where I started, I'm standing for Parliament this year for the National Party. I'm standing for Parliament because I believe that that is the place where we can make a real difference to our policies. I care deeply about my children and all of your children. I want to see all of us fulfilling our potential, and I strongly believe that if we can eliminate drugs from the lives of mothers and of their children, and fathers and of their children, then we will be a stronger community. And so I will listen to all of the evidence and all of the experts who will tell me how we can do that so that more of us in this country can fulfill our potential. Thank you. Kia ora. Uh, thank you, Ross, and thank you, New Zealand Drug Foundation, for having us all here today. Uh, I am by no means an expert. <laughs> uh, my name is Chloe Swarbrick, and I am a candidate for the Green Party. Uh, I'm running in Mongakiakia, which is uh, in Auckland, kind of covering Onehunga, Pamuel, Mount Wellington. So uh, I guess I've, I was invited here today to talk about this from a, a youth perspective, <laughs> uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, but I think where I want to talk from is from the position of somebody who has the potential of being in the house with lawmakers and potentially impacting that. Uh, so I also first and foremost want to acknowledge my privilege. So I am a white woman uh, and I, you know, <laughs> It's likely that I am only ever to know the, what prisons, what our criminal justice system looks like from an academic perspective. 
And for most of us, actually, that, that is the case, uh, looking around the room and further looking at uh, you know, the statistics and the research and criminal justice and those uh, who obviously occupy our prison cells being predominantly Māori, despite the fact that Māori make up 15% of our population. And I think the reason uh, for that and the reason that we've got this massive disconnect is uh, something that I stumbled across talking to uh, an older person uh, the other day at a debate. Uh, and I think that, you know, when you're young, when you're a kid, a toddler, and asking your parents, you know, what are prisons for? Uh, you're told that that's where the bad guys go. And if you don't have any other experience with the criminal justice system or our prisons, that's actually the rhetoric, that's the narrative that you retain all the way to being, you know, 60 years old. That's, that's the way that you look at the system. You're completely disconnected from it. So that's what we as a society, by and large, that's the narrative, that's the story that we tell ourselves. Prisons are where the bad people go, which I think really uh, underscores what was said earlier today, which is that bad policy makes good politics because it appeals to that narrative. And I think that that's inherently problematic. So uh, Kylie Quince, <laughs> who spoke earlier today, uh, was one of my lecturers at law school uh, and is absolutely fantastically amazing and it was great to hear her speak again. Uh, with her I did advanced criminal law and I looked into uh, ways to reduce intergenerational offending. And uh, this is actually one of the many reasons why I'm standing with the Green Party. So Sue Bradford uh, introduced mother and baby units uh, into prisons. And in arguing for the introduction of mother and baby units into prisons, she stood up in the house and said, you know, if you were going to be born into New Zealand tomorrow and you didn't know to what family or where or what your circumstances would look like, do you want our country to look like it does today? And I don't think any of us who genuinely reflect on that question feel comfortable with our country looking the way that it does today insofar as we have the highest rates of inequality that we've had since the 1980s, which is actually when we first started collecting detailed data. The top 1% in our society own three times the wealth of the bottom 50%. One in 100 New Zealanders are homeless, and more than half of them are in work or in training. This is the state of our country, and this is why I also think that whilst it's incredibly important that we're talking about drug law reform, we recognise that this is one part of a broader system. All of this is political, and all of it can change. Our system was built on colonisation, and we are experiencing the ramifications of that today, in so far as those higher rates of incarceration for Māori and we've continued to experience individualization since the 1980s reforms. We've adopted this faux American dream rhetoric where, you know, if you are struggling, it's your own goddamn fault. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We fail to see and acknowledge the systemic inequalities and how those come about. So I'm really stoked uh, to be on this panel today and addressing all of those. Uh, and I also want to address all of the work that all of you in this room have been doing. Uh, Chloe King, who I believe is still so, the other Chloe, uh, who's been tweeting quite a lot recently uh, throughout this symposium, mentioned that, you know, we actually have the systems at the grassroots, at the flax roots level, that can help to address all of these problems. And so far as we have people with lived experiences that are operating the organizations that are, that are helping people with addictions and mental health issues in their communities. And I think that it is really the role of politicians to get behind those people and elevate them. Because change is made at a community level. So let's just not rethink drug law. Uh, let's just not rethink prisons, but let's rethink politics as a whole. Thank you. Foo, this room is on fire. I'll just uh, have to talk a little louder then. 
Uh, tuatahi me mihi ana ki a koutou uh, e te pāpā uh, mō tō uh, karakia uh, i tēnei ata uh, ka nui te mihi ki a koe o tira ki a koutou te mana whenua i wangi nui a tātou uh, ngā uri o te ati awa uh, tēnei te mihi. Uh, o tira ki a koutou uh, a tātou nei uh, kai whakahaire ngā mima uh, Ross uh, o tira uh, tō kaimahi uh, ki a koutou ka toa. O tira, uh, kia koutou, uh, tātou nei kaimahi, uh, tātou nei pukumahi, i nei mahi uh, o te whakaorangatanga o tai mātou nei whānau, hapū, iwi, uh, ngā tangata katoa o tēnei whinua, o tēnei rohi, uh, tēnā koutou. Hoi anō, uh, ko wai uh, tēnei uri e tūana, i wangia nei a uh, tātou, i mua i a uh, koutou, uh, ko māua o te maunga, tairanga te moana, ngā te rangi nui, ngā te rangi ngā iwi, uh, piri rākau, ngā te taka ngā hapū, uh, paparoa te marai, uh, ko kiri tapu Alan tōku ingoa. Uh, ki tau o tōku pāpā he uri ahu o, 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 o ngā te tūwhare tō hoki. Kia ora. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Kiri Allen, and I am Labour's proud East Coast candidate. Um, now, because I'm a candidate, uh, I can kind of get away with a few things that maybe I couldn't if I was actually employed in there and had a job. So, um, I, I guess what I wanted to do this morning is, you know, context is so important. You know, for decision makers, the context from which we come from is important. And I think as I've had the opportunity over the last uh, day and a half to sit within this room, I, I want to acknowledge I really came with, um, I've come with an open kind of mind about these things, uh, about the work that's been discussed here. But um, I also came with a ton of questions. So Ross, I do really want to acknowledge the fact that you've allowed us to be here for the entire duration of this conference. And I really want to acknowledge all of the uh, work that uh, and um, research that I've been privileged to see here, uh, and also the diversity of uh, views and whatnot. For me, when I talk about context, my context always starts with my whanau. Uh, so I, I want to start a little bit with something um, my sister sent through to me this morning. Um, uh, now, I, I'm one of 10 kids, um, and we're a bit of a motley bunch. Uh, I can say that my father and brothers have been in and out of um, incarceration uh, for supply, uh, possession, uh, mostly of meth. Um, and I was talking to my sister this morning, and I just want to acknowledge the things that Chloe said too. You know, we're very privileged. I get a lot of spaces to talk, and often I'm talking on behalf of people. So today, um, in noticing that I was sort of sitting in a room and I was listening to all these great things, I really wanted my sister's voice to come into this room because she shapes the way that I see these issues at a very intimate level. And that's the, uh, I guess that's really what I, I stand here before you. I come with an open heart. Things are shaped by my own life, uh, and I guess we're all standing up here because we want to make things better. So this is from my sister. In 2005, I tried meth for the first time. I had never seen it or heard it before. I was working full time and had a husband and my daughter and life was pretty all normal. We had a girls night out and the next day there was a guy visiting the owner of the house uh, who saw us all a little seedy and said, hey, try this, uh, it'll help fix your seedy heads up. Five of us all had a little try of meth. And for me, I felt on top of the world. I went home, I cleaned the house, so I could look after my daughter. The following week, I thought, that was great stuff. I'm going to try it again. And for the next few years, my life went from normal to ruins. My daughter, my niece, went to live with her paternal grandparents. I met a gang member uh, who was a dealer. He broke my arms and my legs and held guns to my head. I saw a world of dark that I could never imagine existed. My family, they were all scared of me and what I had become. I was scared of me. I fell pregnant and at six weeks, uh, my partner and that gang member I was involved with uh, was proclaimed murdered by the police. His body was never recovered. Witnesses at the trial said he was uh, shot in the head over a meth deal gone wrong and put through um, and his remains uh, uh, weren't found. I, I won't read the details there. 
That was enough to get me right away from the scene and rebuild my life, but it was a struggle and I didn't know where to go or where to turn. Uh, there, is no, there was no immediate help on tap without having to go into an institution where other meth users were and I was scared of who I would encounter. Eventually I did, I changed my life, but it took a really long time and I consider myself as one of the lucky ones. If there were drop-in centres or wellness centres where we could have gone for advice and support, I'm sure it would have been saved a few years earlier. I'm very lucky to be alive. We need more funding for holistic wellness centres as the ones that are available now are too strict to get into and users, they just want to leave. You can't even have a ciggy, it's more like a jail than a wellness centre. Also on recovery, I discovered I had not dealt with childhood issues. And for me, looking back, P was like a plaster in the end. It covered up a lot of hurt that I had not dealt with. I'm sure if you ask any addict about their childhood, there'll be some underlying trauma that needs to be addressed. Thank you, she's asked me, to say to you all for addressing these issues, these dark issues. It's long overdue for solutions and for action. Ami. That's from my sister. I entered into politics because people like my sister and my siblings and my family um, are so disconnected from the system that makes decisions for us, makes decisions um, looking at us but not with us. So I want to acknowledge the commentary of uh, our colleagues this morning. I, too, I mean, I, these, because these issues, and particularly around drug reform, I've always taken a bit of an arm's length myself personally to some of the social issues, uh, these social issues, because I think they're the hardest to deal with. I went down a commercial law route. That stuff's easy. I can negotiate the heck out of a deal. But dealing with real lives, now that stuff's hard. And uh, it's been hard to sit here, listen, and contemplate what these reforms might look like if actually practically implemented. So with what Nicola said, I too, you know, it's, I want to make sure that the policies that are developed, I don't want to say catchphrases, yeah, let's decriminalise, let's legalise, yeah, she'll be right, mate. Well, things won't be right, mate, up where I live in the East Coast, where 49% of my resident population are Indigenous peoples, where we have the highest incarceration rates, drug dependency rates, we have the highest unemployment rates. Policies made here in Wellington have immeasurable impacts on families like ours, communities like mine, electorates like mine. And I want to make sure that that stuff's done right. So I really want to acknowledge the first speaker yesterday morning from Australia. For me, that was a very helpful uh, 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 presentation because I came in here challenged going, oh God, what am I going to say? But I, for me, it legitimised the complexity of the issues and the nuances of the policy debates that need to be had. And I acknowledge that there's book after book that's been written, but still every solution needs to be tailored and it needs to be tailored by us, for us, for our communities. So I commend you all, uh, people working within this space, for what you are doing. Um, as a future potential policy maker, I guess from my perspective, what I really want to see, I want to see things that work. I want to see that these things will reduce harm on kids, reduce harm on communities. I don't want to tout around politically palatable, popular catchphrases because it feels good. I want real solutions. Uh, no reader,